Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Community Diversity Committee for the City of Waterbury. So good to see you all here. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Hope everyone's doing well. All right, and I will start with the roll call. Andrew Beeman. Here. Margaret Bowen. Here. Reverend Angel Castellano. Reverend Angel Castellano. President Jenny Ray Clay. Here. Attorney Isais Diaz. Attorney Diaz. Okay. Francesca Evangelista. Francesca Evangelista. Sabir Gordon. Here. Okay. Pastor Kelsey Hobson. Present. Good evening. Uh, Cherry Lamb. Good evening. Cherry Lamb. Okay. Albana Lame. Here. Althea Marshall Brooks here. Uh, David Morgan. Here. Good evening, David. Uh, Attorney Sean Mosley. Is he on yet? Sean on. Okay. Uh, Mayor Neil O'Leary. Mayor O'Leary. Mayor O'Leary won't be attending this evening. Thank you, Judy. Jim O'Rourke. Jim O'Rourke. Okay. Pastor Christopher Reese. Christopher S. Reese. Yeah, here. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Attorney Leanne Silva Neal. Here. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Dr. Lara White. Here. Good evening. Um, and I do believe uh, Dr. Ruffin has made Dr. White her designee. Is that correct, Dr. White? I, I believe so. She wasn't able to attend this evening. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. We have called the roll and we do have a quorum. Um, this is uh, Attorney Diaz. I just jumped oh. on. I just got out of a lecture, but I am here. Good evening, Attorney Diaz. Good Glad evening. to have you. Thanks Thank for being you. here. All right. Any other arrivals? I want to make sure I'm not missing someone. Let's go through, make sure. All right. All right. Uh, Pastor Reese, would you? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, he, he's, um, I'll go ahead. I'd like to lead everyone now in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. Together. I pledge allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States of, the United States of America, America and the Republic of the Republic of the United States of America, and the Republic of the United States of America. Thank you. We'll move right into You're muted, Althea. Yep, I'm back. Um, move to our next agenda item. Judy, do we have any um, individuals who have scheduled to speak from the public? Not this evening, no. Okay. All right. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the approval of our minutes for the October 20th uh, meeting. Um, I would like to entertain a motion to accept the minutes from our October 20th, 21 meeting. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. That was Andrew Beeman and Pastor Reese, um, first oh. and second. Was that correct? Was that you, Andrew? No, it wasn't. No, no it was me. It was Attorney Diaz. Oh, I'm sorry. Attorney Diaz and then Pastor Reese. My apologies. Correct. Okay. Any discussion? Any discussion on the minutes? Okay. Seeing none. All those in favor of accepting the minutes, do so by saying aye, raising your hand. Aye. 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 Any, any, aye. Any, okay. any opposed? 
Abstentions? Um, I, I'm going to abstain. I wasn't at the meeting, so I'm going to okay. abstain. Sabira Gordon. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Sabira. We have one abstention. And we have the majority, so the motion carries. The minutes are passed. Thank you all. Now to the good stuff. We will now have reports from our committees. And if you do have them, any proposed recommendations, um, we welcome hearing them. I know we did give the committees till December with the hopes of really discussing recommendations in January, but really excited to hear about any and all progress on your committees this evening. Um, and first up is the law enforcement subcommittee who will be reporting for law enforcement. Um, Attorney Neal, I don't know if that's you since um, Mr. Mosley is not here. Are you the only other from the um, law enforcement, Attorney Neal? I, I no, I'm also. I am also. Um, uh, okay. Attorney Diaz also on the the committee. I can report if necessary. Sure. Yes, the law enforcement committee is up first. Thank you so much, Attorney Diaz. So we we had uh, a follow up meeting scheduled for Monday. Um, and uh, with and the, the mayor was to be present, but unfortunately had a conflict, so we moved our our meeting to uh, I think I believe the first week in December, um, because we wanted to be able to have one last conversation with the mayor. We've already had conversations with the elected officials, the chief of police, uh, members of the uh, police commission. Uh, so we we've, we've done a thorough piece in the research. Now we we just want to have a a conversation with the mayor before we uh, narrow down our policy recommendations. And that is the law enforcement subcommittee report. Thank you. Would you like to give some highlights to what some of, um, during the time the committee has convened, some of the things that they found and um, some of the areas where of interest where we see the committee possibly leaning with regard to um, its thoughts and recommendations? Well, yes. So our, our first, obviously, recommendation and thoughts would be to put pressure to, to keep the pressure on for the police department to uh, acquire and the city, which is why we want to have the conversation with the mayor to acquire the uh, body cams and the dash cams and to secure the necessary funding so that we can make sure that officers and the police cruisers do, in fact, have the body cam equipment because um, we, we had a conversation back in July and, I, and there was conversations about contracts being completed, but we haven't heard anything uh, since. So we want to be able to follow up with the mayor on that and make sure that doesn't fall by the wayside again. Um, second, and somewhat alarming to me was we had uh, Alderman Dorso, uh, we had Senator Hartley and uh, State Representative uh, uh, Butler and Reyes in a conversation. And one thing that um, none of them have heard a lot of is complaints of police uh, brutality per se. Um, I'm sure there are instances or instances with the police where uh, cultural sensitivity definitely needs to have a play, but they haven't, they weren't able to provide us with, with um, a solid number of examples. And mind you, I don't have, I wasn't keeping the notes, so I'm going off of my memory to the best of my ability. So if I misquote something or I get a fact wrong, don't nobody uh, scare me now. <laughs> um, what we what we have found is that there's a lot of apathy in the community in trusting the police and also in uh, developing um, uh, working relationships with authorities. There tends to be uh, a small amount of community involvement there was, there was a few events, one being the one over the summer downtown where a pal put on an event. And then there was also a, a night out with the police uh, a couple weeks after. And it was, I, I felt like considering they were giving away so much stuff, including food and backpacks and stuff, I thought it was really heavily unattended. Part of it could have, be with the marketing. So that's something else that perhaps we could work with the, the police on. Uh, but essentially, that's been the gist of what we've been hearing. So. For, with regard to us, perhaps uh, we're leaning towards policy recommendations regarding the the body cams, the the dashboard cams, and also potentially uh, ways that we can 
through policy, find a way to foster a better working relationship between law enforcement and the community. Awesome, thank you so much for that report, uh, Attorney Diaz. Um, anyone else wanna add anything um, to Attorney Diaz's report or have any questions? Uh, through, through, the, through, question. the, through the chair. Oops, sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, ladies first. <laughs> Hi, uh, I don't know why my, oh, there we go. Um, I do know that there has been a process through the Commission of Human Rights and Opportunities at the state level for reporting, and, and I'm not sure if there's some con confidentiality issues, why, uh, has the committee thought of requesting those um, reports that CHRO has to kind of see where Waterbury Falls, and they also compile the research on traffic stops and the disparities within traffic stops, where I guess in thinking about the relationship, I think with the police and the community, I think that might be a place to get the data because I think the data is probably the most important thing here. The trust obviously is a problem because there's a lot of distrust with the community and it doesn't help when there is the perception that crime is going up in our community, which is what a lot of people will say. But I just wonder if the data has been checked as to like what's been reported and what can be changed. Well, we uh, through the chair, I ha we have not considered yet going to state numbers because our our purview is the city of Waterbury. However, um, it's something that we're definitely interested in doing. And well, I'm going to carp DM, seize the moment. I've also been approached by two members of the Waterbury Human Rights Commission um, that are interested in uh, interacting with the diversity committee. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure what the role and function is, but I can check on both the city and the state level with regard to disparities and traffic stops and uh, things of that nature. I, I do think it would be um, helpful. But to, to answer your question, no, we have not uh, tapped into the state resources yet. Thank you. Thank you, Sabira. And uh, thank you for that response, Attorney Diaz. Any other questions? Yes, through the chair. Um, Attorney Diaz, you mentioned about the body cams. Um, and I was under the impression I've had uh, several conversations with the chief and um, Madam President Jenny Ray Clay. Uh, we both attended um, uh, community engagement with uh, the police department where we spoke. And it was mentioned that the body cams were basically a go. Um, the funding was there. Um, they were just kind to work out some last minute details, but uh, I definitely was under the impression that the body cams uh, was definitely a go and was supposed to be launched out in 2022. Well, that is what the chief told us when we, we, he invited us to our meeting. Um, but that's why we want to have the follow up conversation with the mayor, because um, I don't know, call me skeptical in my old age, but I, I, I want to see the, the ink sign in the dotted line. But to right. answer your question, yes, what's been communicated to us from the chief of police um, is that the body cams are a go, that they do have the funding, and they were just working out some co contractual issues. This was in uh, when we invited them to our July meeting. I just like to follow up and cross my T's and dot my I's. So when, 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 they, when I hear, see a press release or I hear uh, firmly that the contracts have been signed, then, um, well, then I can have peace on the issue. But until then, we're going to keep following up. No, um, I just want to make, I just want to make for clarification purposes that, um, you know, it was a go. Um, and I'm with you, you know, until I see, you know, uh, John Hancock on a document, I'm with you 100% with that. Um, the other um, statement that I want to make is that over the course of the summer, um, that the police department was, I believe, engaged heavily 
in the community because I know that they partnered with Grace um, on at least five events um, over the community, uh, with the community outside of the two that they sponsored themselves. Um, and so, you know, I just wanted to put that out there that I know that they were really heavily involved over the summer in the community because we worked with them on at least five um, community events. Uh, yeah, I, I agree, uh, Pastor Reese. But the, but the vibe that we were getting was from the police was that they wanted more, even more community partnership and even more community outreach, um, more so from a community participation standpoint than uh, the police trying to make an effort. So I probably should have clarified that. Um, because one of the things that the chief was saying was that it, it seems like it's always the same people getting involved and they want to broaden the community participation. Um, so that's something else that we want to foster. Because when you like your police and you know your police and you trust your police, it makes it easier for everybody. Right. Okay. Thank you. Just everyone, I just want to let you know that I, I can certainly check on the status of the body cams and, and where that is. I know that the mayor's schedule is difficult, and I certainly want to have a response for you, and I know he would want to provide that as well. So that's something I'll look into as well and hope to update you for before the next meeting. Thank you, Judy. We appreciate that. Thank you. Great discussion. Any uh, additional questions? for law enforcement subcommittee. Okay. The next we will have, thank you so much, Attorney Diaz and others. Um, we will now have a report out from the Economic Opportunity and Housing Committee. I believe the chair is Mr. Beeman. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, so our, our team is uh, David Morgan, Jenny Ray Clay, Margaret Haywood Bowen, and I. Um, before we jump into the our draft recommendations that we have, just want to restate some of the the mission and purpose of the committee that was identified in the month of March. So, first, it was to it, it, this was approved in the month of March as the purpose and mission statement to identify and address racial inequities in the city of Waterbury, create solutions and make policy recommendations to the administration, board of aldermen and board of education. All right, so uh, I, I just wanna restate this as, I, as we go through our recommendations. I just wanna provide clarity to what we're doing and why. Um, I think in the summer it, it changed to, instead of the recommendations going to administration, board of aldermen and board of education, it was changed to this is what's going actually to the mayor. So for our subcommittee, it's mission and purpose. We align with this. We have to identify and address racial inequities in the city of Waterbury's economic development and housing and create solutions and make economic development and housing policy recommendations to the mayor. All right. So begin our research, our discussions, our requests for data, and here are our draft recommendations we're going to still work through this in the upcoming weeks and finalize this in the month of december before the due date so first recommendation is a declaration or proclamation from the city that racism is a public health crisis and to really formally acknowledge that systematic racism is an issue that needs to be addressed why did we add this because based on our, our discussions, our research, or working on this committee, it feels as though the city's interest in identifying and addressing racial inequities is, is really starting to fade from the urgency that we had last year. And even the belief that anti-Black racism or systematic racism exists in the city of Waterbury um, just doesn't feel the same as it was last year during the town falls and the marches. And, and not trying to get on a soapbox or grandstand or anything like that, but uh, we were asked as a committee to address these issues. And based on these experiences of um, seeking information, seeking data related to racial inequities, um, our committee's really deeply concerned that the city's interest to take action has has faded. So, so therefore, that that is the first ask. And um, you know, we really can't address the issue without 
first acknowledging that there is an issue. So, so we need the city to do that. And the, the second recommendation that we have is a disparity study. It's, again, it, it's apparent from our, our lack of data that has been provided to this committee that data related to race, um, tracking, tracking the data, monitoring it, and um, even collecting it just isn't happening. And, and in some cases, some of this data collection is, is a federal requirement. So from, from my understanding, the, the community has been asking for a disparity study for like over 10 years. And um, we think it's important to just kind of hold the mirror up and, and learn what is the state of racial inequity in the city of Waterbury. So that's why that is our second, in, second recommendation, a disparity study for the city of Waterbury. So I'll, I'll pause there and um, see if anybody else in the group has anything else to add. And, uh, and I think Jenny Ray has a couple items around um, housing. Uh, through the chair, I, I, can I say something to Attorney Diaz? Yes. Yes, Attorney. So I, I do agree with uh, 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 Mr. Beeman in that I, felt, I also feel like the buzz was really hot when it was a, a, a popular topic and interested, interest has faded um, in, in many aspects. And, and so I, I, I do want to echo the same sentiment and that I'm, I have the same feeling, not only from the city, but also from the community. And um, I, I just, uh, I do agree with Mr. Beeman that we have to keep, keep the needle moving so that we can uh, get the work done. Dr. Laura White has shared um, some information in the chat. Uh, Mr. Beeman, if you'd like to respond to that. So Mr. Beeman, I, again, I, I live in the town of Windsor. I was very proud of the fact that we did actually make this as a declaration. The town council did um, adopt this. And so I was just reminding you of that, that there have been towns in Connecticut that have been successful. You know, it's not necessarily a Waterbury situation, but they might provide a little bit of a roadmap too. Um, and the implications of doing so. So I would just uh, just remind you of that. And then again, maybe reach out to folks that have done this work um, in those towns and then just, you know, get some information from them too of those outcomes. Because again, it's the idea of like, we want this to be adopted, but what, what are the next steps? Like what were the outcomes of adopting? Because again, the last thing we want is just, you know, a lot of noise and a nothing. Um, and and so I think it's also important to look at well what what how has this influenced those towns' policies by adopting it? So I would just I would just remind you that yeah it, it might be a good time to kind of reach out and contact people in those towns how they did that process and what they feel the outcomes have been. Hey, uh, thank you, thank you, Doctor White. And uh, uh, through, through the chair. Yeah. Yes, uh, Pastor Reese. Pastor Reese has so, a comment or question. Yes. Um, uh, good evening, Andrew. Um, so, for clarification, um, I, I thought and I was under the impression that the Human Rights Commission um, was working on um, a declaration to identify that racism is a public health crisis in Waterbury. Um, we saw a draft of a resolution. I think earlier um, in the year, we tried to actually get someone from that commission to uh, join our meeting to kind of discuss the progress um, and it never worked out. Do you know where they are um, on the declaration? Okay, so, so two things. First, um, uh, Dr. White, thank you. Thank you for that recommendation. Uh, I think you were speaking, you were speaking specifically about the declaration to acknowledge racism as a public health crisis, correct? I turned my mic off, sorry. Yes, so again, it was just, again, coming into Waterbury and, and getting familiar with the issues and the histories um, and 
it was just, again, that frame of reference of this is important. Um, the work is incredibly important. It's very important to acknowledge. But I also would be interested in finding out more what has the outcome been for these towns and these other cities that might have adopted this resolution. Did it have the outcome we would want? in terms of bringing the yeah, attention to yeah. the issue, if funding, policy shift, you know, that's all. Yeah, all right, yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I understand where you're coming from there. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what the next steps were for other cities after they acknowledged racism as a public health crisis, but, um, and I think that's something that our city should think about too. Um, and And not only because regardless of if they acknowledge it or not, they st still have to take the next steps, right? And so we're, we're saying that not even acknowledging that it is a public health crisis may be part of the cause of interest fading and people not taking the next, next steps and not having a sense of urgency when we're asking and looking for data. If they could, if this was a concern for the city, then they would act on the data. And I think the city making that proclamation or declaration could cause them. The results that we're hoping for for that is that it could propel us to actually take action within the city. So so with that, um, but uh, Pastor Reese, you, you mentioned the Human Rights Committee. I don't know. All, all I know is that there was a resolution, just like you, you stated, there was a re resolution and it stopped there as a resolution. So it started as a suggestion and stopped as a suggestion. Um, and that's and that's where it is. That's why we're adding this as a recommendation. Okay. Uh, thank you, because I, I do know this morning uh, watching the news that uh, Colchester um, reversed its declaration of uh, racism as a public uh, health crisis. They actually reversed it. Um, and so you have some towns that's going backwards instead of forwards. And I think Dr. White's point is on point on her recommendation. Yeah, and, and I'm, and, and yeah, and I, I think this request is not really just for economic development. This would be for the entire committee. So um, yeah, I, I, maybe we could open it up to the group because the disparity study is specific for economic development, but the declaration to acknowledge racism as a public health crisis and that systematic racism exists in the city of Waterbury and it needs to be identified and addressed. Um, maybe we could open up to the, to the groups and chairs if, if this is something that the, our committee wants the mayor and the city to act on and state and do a declaration, we can move forward. If it's not something that's of interest for this entire committee, then we could, you know, we could put it to rest. Through you, Madam Chair, I have a question. Sure, Sabira, and then we have a hand raised for our Obama. So, Sabira? Okay. Um, for the disparity study, are you looking at, I guess what comes to mind immediately for me is contracting and like, per, like how is the city um, working with minority businesses, minority contractors? Is that the like is that the scope that they're think that you're thinking about for the disparity study or is that information that could be requested um from the city itself because i imagine like purchasing that those records should easily should exist and that information should be easily extrapolated and then once we have that i think as a council we could make we could like talk about is 10 percent of the city's or is 10% of the city's contracts with minority businesses? Is that enough? Do we need more? Mm. That's how I'm, that's how I think about this. So I, so I have a little bit of experience dealing with disparity studies. And one of the problems I will say is they take too long. And if the data exists, the time it's going to take for an outside company to come in the bidding process to get the disparity study done, not to say that it shouldn't be done, but there might mm -hmm. just be more short term things that if we want to, if we're talking about purchasing, we should just ask about purchasing while mm -hmm. we continue to do the disparity study in the background. So I guess that's just my thought process on this a little bit. Yeah, uh, I'll say one thing to that and I'll, I'll turn it over to the group. I'll let Jenny Ray and 
David and, and Margaret chime in on this one on, on, in your, on your question, but um, there has been no luck getting data from the purchasing department. Um, but, but I'd like to speak to that. I know, Ad, I know, Ad, Andrew, you requested that information through our office to the purchasing department. Anyone that places a bid within the city of Water, so bids are advertised in the newspaper, and we also have an e-procurement system for the city of Waterbury. And um, so pe we don't track it by race. It's, tr it's self-reported. So when people put in a bid, you can self-report whether you're a minority business, a veteran business, a women-owned business, whatever that is. So the bids are open to everyone. They're, they're, if you sign up for the e-procurement system, you can bid on a city job. If you see everything is advertised in the newspaper, well, it tells you to, to go to the e-procurement system and you can sign up and it's open to anyone who likes to bid. Again, it's self-reported. We don't track it by gender, race, anything like that. It's a self-reporting system. So I think if you want to make specific recommendations about whether the city wants to do that or that's something that should be done, you know, that's yeah. another question. But it is a self-reported system. Yeah, yeah, Judy, two, two things on that. Um, one, if we're not collecting it, we should. And then the okay. other thing is, and the other thing is, it is collected because when you go in to fill out a bid, you have optional things that you can fill out. So it's self-reported, meaning when I go in to do a bid, I could select my gender, I could select my race. So there is data collected on race. And but if we don't know how to pull that data out of the system, that that's another question. But um, it's something that was requested because we know it is collected. But um, the, maybe we could hop over to, I'll pass it over to Jenny Ray to talk about the disparity study, what it could look like. But this is something that we'll still talk through over the next couple of weeks as a team to figure out how to best um, request a disparity study. But I'll, I'll pass it over to Jenny Ray. Well, um, Andrew, you did uh, an amazing job um, um, reporting in on, on the work that we have been doing. So a disparity study has been requested for like the last 20 years, and the city has refused to, um, to commission a study. Um, we have asked multiple uh, departments uh, for data on doing business with African-American or minority-owned companies. Um, you're right, the, you can self-report, um, but why can't the, the information be extracted from the data that is already there. The city of Waterbury has no affirmative action plan. It has an affirmative action statement, if, if my memory serves me correctly. And what we are asking for is, and we have, we have received complaints over the years that minority businesses cannot get um, contracts and are not doing business with the city of Waterbury for whatever reason. And that's why we want the, the disparity study to show the lack of minority businesses um, receiving contracts within the city and their taxpayers, the people that live here. Um, I personally am involved in economic development. I have been involved with economic development for the past 35 years. I talk to business owners. I talk to contractors every day. Um, contractors leave the city of Waterbury. They go to cities like Bridgeport. They go to cities like New Haven um, for uh, contract opportunities because some of those municipalities do have um, set aside or special programs for minority owned businesses. Generally it's for minority owned businesses in their towns because that's who they're taking care of. So we're just curious and would like to see what the what it looks like here in Waterbury and how it can get better. Thank you, uh, Madam President, I appreciate that. Um, Albana has her hand up. Is that a question for? Um... Yes, for Mr. Beeman. Um, I know one of the things you mentioned is in, in regards to education, if I'm not, not mistaken, uh, what goes on in the city of Waterbury, am I correct? Can, can you say that again? You meant something about education? What, what, correct, is, is that one of the areas of recommendations that you guys are working toward in your committee? No, no, it's economic no. development and housing. Okay. 
I, I think this kind of applies, I believe. Um, have we ever thought to ask for a community assessment, um, to ask the city of Waterbury to do a community assessment and to see what we can come up from the community in terms of figuring out some of the uh, barriers that may be identified directly from um, individuals that are not represented, right? That individuals that don't have um, a voice to speak for themselves. So have we ever thought of making a recommendation um, in terms of a community assessment that can be applicable to different components of city government yeah. that impacts the community as a whole? I think that's a good idea. Um, um, I mean, that, that may be a part of the disparity study, but um, Jenny Ray? Yeah, I, I, when you said community assessment, can you, can you clarify that? Community assessment, so in terms of community development, right? We are, we're trying to figure out who are the individuals that, uh, if we don't get the data from the city, right? What other recommendations can we do in order for the city to look back and say, here's what we recommend, um, to to kind of get the input from the community at a bigger scale. So hopefully the data will show exactly what we want to make happen moving forward. But who's going to do that study? Who's going to do the assessment? The, we can make a recommendation to the city of Waterbury to implement a community assessment study to hopefully again show the data that where the disparities are. So it would be the city of Waterbury. It would be a recommendation from all the subcommittees or a specific subcommittee to the city of Waterbury for a specific um, project or for a specific service that it's currently, we, we feel that there's disparity in. Well, I, I can just speak from the economic development and the business side of it. And I can tell you that the a disparity study has been requested and requested and requested, and the city refuses to commission one. And uh, I just think the city should. If we're gonna look at the opportunities that exist, that disparity study will show that there is no disparity. If the city is doing everything that it can um, to help grow uh, minority-owned businesses, to do business with minority-owned businesses, the disparity study will show that that's what they're doing. If they're not doing it, which we know they're not doing it, it will show that they're not doing it. And get yeah, it open, you know, let's, 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 let's just get it done. Yeah, and to add, add to that, like, as you mentioned, with the community studies, um, we're, we're not, our, our goal isn't to track more opinion polls. You know, um, I think we had that during the focus groups in the town halls, that they, they shared their concerns. Um, our, our goal is to look at actual data to identify where there are systemic barriers, that not, not opinion polls. So that, that has to go for the disparity study, to, to point out specific areas in economic development where there are disparities so we could identify solutions. We don't even have data on minority-owned businesses that have received funding through the economic development entities. No data is collected, or actually, I'm not going to say it's not collected. No data was provided to our committee for African American or minority lending, access to capital, access to contracts. Nothing. None of that data is 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 handy and available. All right. Any other Madam, uh, Madam Co-Chair through the chair. Yeah. Uh, Pastor I do, yes, I do want to commend um, this committee um, for the report this evening and especially aligning their recommendations with the purpose and mission that we outlined early this year. And so I definitely want to commend this committee uh, for an excellent report tonight. Thank you, Pastor East, and um, echo that. And I, I think we have to realize this, that this <laughs> David said here, here in the chat. Thank you for that, that report. Um, and it seems like there's some clear recommendations around next steps to, to get to that information, just as an FYI. 
state put out an RFP in June. Okay, Dr. Lara is providing some resources and some information. Thank you. Um, so we look forward to um, those recommendations that will be formalized in the, in the upcoming month. But thank you so much, Madam President and uh, Mr. Beeman for, for that report. Next, we have public health, um, Pastor Hobson. Yes, greetings to everyone. So the Public Health Committee, uh, we weren't uh, unable to, uh, to meet this month. However, we do have uh, some information to report. We uh, have a, a new member, Francesca Evangelista, the program officer for uh, CCF. Uh, and our current next steps, uh, it does include uh, uh, some measures regarding uh, to uh, declaring racism a, a public health uh, crisis. Uh, we too uh, uh, are uh, concerned about that uh, and uh, definitely uh, commend uh the the previous committee on report and the steps that you uh that you are, are taking and the recommendations uh, uh our committee uh we're going to be taking a uh a look at a webinar series uh as i believe we shared on 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 last month dealing with the current racism uh public health uh crisis uh we likewise are looking uh at anti-racist policy making uh, substitute Senate Bill Number One, Public Health Act, uh, which is an act equal, uh, equalizing comprehensive access to mental behavior and physical health care in response to the pandemic. We'll be taking a look at that. Other next steps uh, we're going to be discussing in our next meeting: uh, the report and materials from the presentation um, uh, that dealt with uh, maternal health, Waterbury. Baby, uh, baby bundle uh, strategies focused on improving the health of women and babies most at, at risk. And we will be inviting uh, to Keisha Everett, which is the executive director of Health Equity Solutions. Uh, and their vision uh, is uh, for every Connecticut resident to attain optimal health, uh, regardless of race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. And our reason for inviting uh, her uh, is to receive some input and recommendations uh, you know, from them uh, as uh, we move forward uh, to uh, address uh, public health in, in Waterbury. Uh, that concludes our report. Um, uh, are there any, any questions? Uh, through the chair. Pastor Reese. Yes, I'm on a roll tonight. Uh, I'm Pastor Hobson. Um, last month, I mentioned uh, contacting the Waterbury Health Department regarding the $4 million um, uh, advanced health literacy grant that the city received. And I think that this committee should be aware um, of what this grant entails um, and how it will um, affect uh, the community of Waterbury. Um, so I, I would recommend someone from this committee to call um, the Waterbury Health Department, um, Aisling or Cindy um, there to really get an understanding of the, imp the implementation of this grant. Pastor Reese, you in, this, you, in the, you in the fast lane, you already moved behind from the, 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 the regular lane and you went over to the passing lane because you got right ahead of me. I was, that's right where I was gonna go. <laughs> Great minds take a light, Madam Co-Chair. So thank you, sir. Um, so yeah, we I, we have done that. We received that recommendation and have been in touch with Aisling uh, McGunkin, the new director of the health department, to talk about the grant. And the focus is of, of, of the grant really is about addressing issues of stru structural racism um, in healthcare and its impact on communities of color specifically. I'm really excited about the opportunity and the work that will be happening through through that grant and um, the very the cross sector approach they're taking, including the faith community, but also 
engaged um, at the community level uh, around that. So yes, um, more to come next month um, about that. Also in conversation with Trinity Health, who, as you know, St. Mary's Hospital is a part of it in the infant and maternal health um, morbidity and mortality issues specific for Black women and Black babies is something that's being looked at. Um, we happen to have the highest rate of infant and maternal mortality for Black women and Black babies um, in the state. And so it's something we definitely have to consider, um, as well as numbers um, that are of concern for other uh, women of color and uh, birthers of color. Um, so yes, more to come on that. Um, Pastor Reese and others, um, as that grant rolls out, um, it's a significant opportunity to really um, um, improve um, systems and address the barriers. Um, and issues um, that keep people from, from being healthy well, um, healthy and well. And so, yeah, thank you so much for lifting that. Any questions for members of the Public Health Committee? I do want to acknowledge Mr. Mosley and Ms. Evangelista have joined us for the meeting as well. Any questions for the Public Health Committee? Okay. Thank you so much. We'll now have the report out from the Education Committee. Ms. Gordon. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so on, sorry, my daughter is having a fight with a balloon right now. Um, so unfortunately, we were not able to meet this month. I think I finally figured out what the issue is. I apologize. We've had a couple of meetings that I can give an update on. Um, I messed up, I was traveling and messed up and didn't send the agenda out in time. And I didn't realize we could have met using a personal Zoom link, not the city's Zoom link. Now I know this, but we've had conversations with uh, the superintendent about what changes have occurred with the city of Waterbury and their school-based arrests. As I think many of you know, Waterbury is one of the highest, if not the highest, this um, city where young people are arrested. So what we did ask uh, the superintendent for, and now that Dr. White is on this call, I think we, I can probably turn over some of those conversations to her, is a, like reporting on what's changed. I know a lot's changed since Dr. Dr. Ruffin came in, but we'd love to see the statistics and the data to show what's being done now, as opposed to what was being done before. and how can we had kind of an in-depth conversation about the responsibilities of family and school and how can we bridge some of those connections so for example something that i didn't know anything about like the TikTok challenge of the stop your teacher challenge or whatever that was going around so what kind of resources can we collectively share with Excuse parents me? to say, you know, this is what's Excuse happening me? in school. Yeah, hey, can you wait, please? It's not an emergency. Thank you. Um, what, like, what resources can we share with parents so they could bet, so we can create just a better relationship <laughs> at home with the school so we can avoid having some of the issues that we've had. And I know there's been a lot of work around saying like, young kids should not be able to be arrested. I think like, having young kids of my own i think it would i just don't think any young person should be in handcuffs it's like what policies do we need to ensure that we have in place that a seven-year-old cannot ever be arrested regardless of the issue um, so that's kind of where we have been in the conversations that we've been having and i think um we will have a meeting i'm going to try to organize a meeting before the end of this month and we'll have some recommendations for December. Thank you, Sabira. Uh, any questions for um, Sabira on the education sub subcommittee? Questions? Okay. All right. Thank you all for, for your reports. Um, it's really good work happening. Um, change isn't easy, um, but you're all leaning into that space and um, our city is only gonna be better for it on the other side of this work. So I encourage you to stay the course. 
you know, um, these are are difficult, uncomfortable and messy conversations at times for us to begin to have around these inequities, the disparities that exist. Um, And when you look at in the case of the public health, to know that women who look like me are are dying in childbirth, 38% uh, during pregnancy, 45% within the first 42 days after having a child and 18% at the 40, after 43 days after having a child and that 40 to 50% of women of color are not even returning for their appointments um, six weeks after giving birth when we know issues around cardiovascular issues can arise, infections and stuff. So these are conversations we have to have. Um, You know, there's no personal indictments here or any individual, we're here coming together collectively to address this so that communities that have been marginalized and disenfranchised can have the opportunity to thrive. And so I thank you for all of your work that you're doing. Um, I know the mayor is looking forward to hearing the recommendations from us. So continue the work. Um, Your subcommittees, we made a commitment to give the recommendations, I believe in January. Is that correct, um, Pastor Reese, co-chair? That that is correct. Um, So I look forward to hearing that. And I know all of you hopefully I know the holidays are coming, so if you can please make your subcommittee meetings for December um, and get the, those agendas um, into Judy in the time frame in which she can get them posted and you can ha- uh, have the meetings uh, occur, I would greatly appreciate that. We've had our own challenges as we all do. We are all volunteers here. So again, thank you for your service and commitment um, to this work. Um, so I want to make sure um, um, I did say that. Um, and some things have already been lifted. So I'm assuming those have been noted and hopefully we can have um, a response to some of the things that um, have been requested that were not um, originally responded to. Um, any other comments on any of the subcommittee report outs before we go to the next agenda item? Okay, the new business. Um, Pastor Reese, if you want to chime in with me, um, as uh, we were informed, Amari Brantley would no longer be able to serve on the committee. Um, And so we received a recommendation for another uh, young adult. I do think it's extremely important to have the voice um, of young people at the table. And the name that was recommended to us was Melvin Van III. I think I have that correct, Pastor. Um, and Pastor Reese and I had the opportunity to review his resume, extremely involved um, in the community, in his church, um, doing a lot of work with youth and young adults through post-university, um, a mentor. Uh, Pastor Reese, I don't know if you want to chime in, any things you would like to add to um, who this young man is? Yeah, um, he's very, very engaged um, in young adult work. Um, he has the passion and desire to um help young adults, you know, improve uh, their lives, especially in their in the community. Um, so I was very impressed with the conversation. And one of the things that I recommended to Madam Co-Chair is that I believe that our committee needs a youth and young adult subcommittee um, because I'm, I'm almost half of a century and I cannot uh, relate um, a lot to young adults, even though I have children and all of that, but I think that there are issues. Um, we may be overlooking what their issues are and to have a youth and young adult subcommittee of this diversity committee and to hear from that generation. I know um, attorney Mosley um, has pushed and pushed um, you know, to make sure that young adults are represented on this com- uh, committee as a whole, but I really would like to see if this committee you know, would um, embrace having a youth and young adult subcommittee that will focus um, on their needs. Thank you. So Judy, if we can make note of that recommendation um, uh, and we can share that with the, I share with everyone um, the resume for Mr. Van, hopefully you had an opportunity to look at that. Um, Hopefully what we've shared demonstrates that he would be a good candidate. Um, born and raised in the city of Waterbury, went through Waterbury Public Schools, um, attended post-university for both his undergrad and graduate degree. So this is someone who's uh, deeply connected um, to the city. Uh, Judy, I see you unmuted yourself. 
Yeah, no, I'll share that. I'll run that, that, that resume by the mayor and we'll, we'll get that taken care of. Thank you. Of course. And if there's some, some consideration for maybe um, convening <clears throat> ad hoc um, youth and young adult subcommittee, we do have some folks under a few young folks here on the committee. I'm young at heart. I'm not going to tell y'all my age like Pastor Reese did, but I'm young at heart. <laughs> um, but I am not a youth or young adult. So if we could have um, uh, a consideration <laughs> for a youth ad hoc committee to consider our recommendations and anything that our subs may have have missed to hear from them. Because I think definitely um, it definitely is it, we should have uh, that that input. So thank you for lifting that, um, Pastor Reese and, um, and, uh, and Attorney Mosley as well. Madam yeah, Coach, may, may I speak to that? Uh, yeah, is that um, Attorney Mosley? Is that you? Yeah, you just call me okay. Sean. You just call okay. me Sean. Uh, one, one recommendation to that is maybe reaching out to some of the youth civic organizations that are already in place and maybe asking if they have um, representatives from those organizations. For instance, the NAACP Youth Council, uh, Madre Latina, the, their youth leaders program also Save Girls on Fire. It might be, you know, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, maybe reaching out to those organizations and having them send one or two representatives. Awesome. We also have a youth um, advisory think tank called Let Youth Lead. So, yes, I agree. There's okay. some, some youth doing some real substantive um, work. And I think that's a good idea instead of trying and maybe have them come together. And again, possibly as an ad hoc committee um, to serve to provide some insight on the work of this committee. Um, and, and I'd also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention reaching out to the faith-based community and those in the youth that are involved in our local faith-based community. Um, that would be great. Agreed. That, that was really exciting for me about this um, young man who has expressed interest is that he himself is um, working with a lot of youth in his church. He's very active in his church as well. I think um, maybe having that bridge is definitely important. So thank you for that. So um, Judy, that that's a, a request as well. So it would be an ad hoc committee um, connected to um, this um, broader, uh, this committee of the whole. There's a possibility and, for that. And I, and I will say, Madam Chair, I, I am youthful, but youthful, youth is fleeting. <laughs> youth <Listen>. is fleeting. <laughs> Just hold on as much of to, to as much of it as you can. Just yes, <laughs> not much left, but I got a little bit left. That's it. <laughs> All right. Um, so we uh, will pass that on to you, uh, Judy. The uh, resume and references of Mr. Melvin Van. I also sadly need to report that I did hear from Julia West, and unfortunately, she will not be able to serve on the committee. Is really happy about the work that's happening, but is unable to uh, avail herself to the work of the committee. Um, so we now have another vacancy and she was another very powerful voice of a young person who had been um, selected in uh, a part of this committee um, and also in the healthcare field, which was something we definitely wanted to um, lean on and lean into. So Judy, we will be considering um, hopefully another individual to, to fill that vacancy. And I've asked if she had a colleague that she could recommend who had experience in the healthcare field as well, and who was a youth or young adult. So um, hope to hear back from her soon, and we'll share that um, upon receipt. Okay, thank you, uh, Althea. You're welcome. And, welcome. Madam Chair, I do have someone that I will get a resume to. I think she would be um, an excellent fit, especially as we do the ad hoc committee. So mm -hmm. I will get her resume um, over to you and then we can schedule a call with her as well. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, um, I see folks need to hop off. We're at about 8.05. This was a very rich um, discussion tonight and thank you again all for your hard work. Um, look forward to hearing um, the, about the work of your subcommittees in the month of December. So until then, um, best, wish, best wishes. Happy eating um, as you enjoy your time off next week um, and look forward to seeing you all in the weeks to come in December. And with that, I will welcome a motion to adjourn if there is no other questions, concerns, compliments, critiques, um, hand claps, foot taps. I would take a motion I, to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Second okay. the motion. 
All right. Second. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say, I'm out of here. Have a great I'm night. Good night. Good night. Take care, you all. Good seeing everybody. Good. Be well. Good night, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Take care.